Welcome to Dr. BT's Chemistry Essentials, A-Level Chemistry Made Easy. In this lesson, we're going to look at working out the order of a reaction from graphical data sources. So the first types of graphs that we're going to look at are graphs that are constructed from concentration time data. So here we have a typical data table that you'd collect using continuous monitoring. So every 30 seconds here, the concentration of a reactant has been calculated. And this would carry on indefinitely until you believe that the reaction had completed. So no more increase in the reactant concentration. So once you plot the time data against the concentration data, you come up with a concentration time graph. And depending on the order of reaction for that particular reactant that you've been monitoring, you will get one of three shapes at A-level, as shown here. And it's those shapes that you see here that will tell you the order of the reaction with respect to the reactant that you've been monitoring and allow you to work out whether it be zero, first or second order. So we're just going to focus in on each of these graphs individually. This first graph here is a reactant concentration over time. You can see that because it's decreasing. In fact, all of these graphs are reactant monitoring, um, which links to our data table here. And if your, if your graph shape is a direct ink decrease, okay, so it's a straight line decrease, then you know your reactant is zero order. If you were to plot your data and you get a curved decrease, then it could be first order or it could be second order. Now, you can see that the second order curve here is a lot steeper than the first order curve here shown for comparison. But you can see that visually, it's going to be very difficult to make that call of whether something is first order or second order based on the concentration time graph. However, one thing to notice about the first order curve is that the time taken for the concentration to half will be exactly the same. So if we take this where it divides by two and read off the time it takes and do the same here and here and here, then the gap, the time difference, even on this approximation, should be exactly the same. We say that first order with respect to the reactant has a half-life which is constant. And that is given the symbol T for time, half, and this is our constant half-life. This cannot be said for second order or zero order reactants. So if you were to use the same method by looking at the time it takes for the concentration of the reactant to half, you would not get a exact same half-life time for either of these graphs here. And so that is conclusive evidence that you've got a first order um, with respect to that reactant. In fact, if you're asked to work out the half-life of a reactant, then it's very likely that you're going to be dealing with a first-order one. Otherwise, your data won't work. So we're going to look at this in a bit more detail, and we're going to look at how we can take the half-life of a first-order reactant and use this graphically to work out the rate constant K. So if we had the reaction of the reactant A decomposing to produce two new products B and C, one way that we could go about working out what the rate constant K is, is to basically rearrange a rate equation. Now we know there's only A as the reactant in there. Um, we would have to be told that this was first order, so we'd need to know that the power M equals 1. Then we'd have to work out the rate using an initial rates method. So we would take a tangent at zero and we'll work out the change in y over the change in x. And to make life easy, we'd make sure that we are going close and bisecting both the y and the x axes. 
with our tangent line. And so we would read off our change in y as being between the area here and 0. And our change in x is where the tangent line bisects the x-axis and the difference where we go to, which is 0, which gives us 0 0.125. And the units of this, in this case, will be moles per decimeter cubed over per minute. So with the rate part now calculated, what we need to do is calculate the um, work out the concentration at that particular point in time. So this concentration was at the, the very beginning. And so the concentration here at time zero, as you can see, is four moles per decimeter cubed. And we can see therefore that our, the tangent line that was drawn in the initial bit is slightly off because when we read off the tangent curve, it was 3.9 at time zero. But it doesn't matter, we've got a bit of leeway in our calculation. Um, and so what we've now got is we've got the rate and we've got our concentration at time zero. We know it's first order and you'd be need to told, told that if you were to use this method. So we're just going to rearrange this equation to get k. So keeping k on the right hand side, rate is already there. We're going to divide by concentration of A. Then all we need to do is input in the two values that we have here and here into these areas. We know that A is to the power of 1, so that's absolutely fine. And so that equals 0.03145. And our units, well, these cancel out. And so it's minute minus 1. And you'll notice that for any first order reaction, the units of K, the rate constant, are always the time to the minus one. As the units of concentration always cancel each other out. So this is a rather long winded way. Um, it can be used, of course, um, but if you've got a first order reactant, then actually you can use the half-life instead of using this way. Because this whole method has not used the half-life at all. Instead, the method that uses the half-life uses this formula here that you need to know for the exam. Rate constant K is natural log 2 over T half. So this method avoids using um, a tangent um, and the, the issues that you have with reading the tangent correctly. All it requires you to do is on your calculator to find LUN. Um, and those of you who don't do maths, this might be the first time you've come across this, the natural log. On a Casio calculator, for example, it's found exactly next to log, just to the right of it, um, and is LN, LUN. And all we need to therefore do, because this is a mathematical operation, is to work out what the half-life is. So this, only, this method only works for first-order curves. So we've got this curve here for a first-order reactant. So we're going to read off the half-life for this reaction. So I first start with the initial concentration 4, and I just need to half this, so go down to 2, and read off the graph up to the curve, exactly how long that took for that concentration to decrease by half. So we've allowed the, the reading to come out, then we just read down, and, and there, in our time taken for this to half, what we've done is worked out that this takes 18 minutes to happen. At this point, it's important to just define what the half-life is, as this can be an easy mark or two to get in the exam. So the half-life of a reaction is the time it takes for half of the reactant to be used up. Now, in order to definitely make sure we've got the correct value for T half, what we need to do is just do this one or two more times just to check and take an average if need be. So we're going to look again at the time it takes for 2 moles per decimeter cube to half. So that takes it down to 1. Read off the line here 
and look at the difference between two moles and one mole and the time it taken to get there. So uh, with my data here, it's 16, obviously, depending on how good your data is. But this is close enough for us to understand that this is a constant half-life. And we're going to do it just one more time. So we're going to take one moles per decimeter cubed. Half of this is 0.5. And then we're going to read off the time it takes for that to happen. And this time it's 17. So the average of all three of these, they're really close together and we've got some sort of uh, le leeway due to the sources of inaccuracy in our data points and drawing the curve. But we've got a T half of 17 minutes. So all that remains is to work out the rate constant K. We're just going to do LUN2 divided by 17. And if we do this, LUN2 works out to always be 0.693. But that doesn't, you don't need to remember that because you've got your calculator. You divide by 17 and you get the answer of 0 0.041. And this is minutes minus one. You can see that obviously between our two methods, we've got slightly different values here, but they're close enough. I would definitely keep this to memory. This is going to be really important. Um, although both methods can be used to generate a answer. This one is typically a lot faster, so it means you're picking up marks really quickly. And sometimes it might actually ask you to use this method because it is one of the specification points at A-level chemistry. Now, one important point is it doesn't matter what concentration you start with, whether it be higher than four or less than four, you're always going to get the same half-life for that specific type of reaction. So if I started at 8 moles per decimeter cubed, it would still take 17 minutes for it to reduce our reactant by half to 4 moles per decimeter cubed. And vice versa, if I started obviously at 1, to go to 0 0.5, it'd also take 17 minutes. So that's an important conceptual understanding to take away also. Another thing just to be aware of is the half-life is always the units of it is always determined by the units on the x-axis. So it could be seconds, it could be minutes, it could be even years. So here's a typical exam question using a concentration time graph. What I'd like you to do is pause the video here and see if you can come up with the approach that you take in order to determine the initial rate of reaction and the rate constant for this graph here. Now, I appreciate you probably are finding it very difficult. If you have come up with your method for the initial rate of reaction, you'd obviously need to draw a tangent at time zero. This is going to be very difficult if you're on a computer um, or a device. So I'm just going to draw a tangent line for you and also help you read off the readings so that you can carry on with your calculation. So here we have tangent line we're extending so we've got 270 seconds if we read that and then on the y-axis and so with these values you should now be able to work out your initial rate of reaction and then the rate constant so again pause video here if you want to see what actual answer you get So the initial rate um, is a change in the y over a change in the x. Now, because of the way we've constructed our tangent line, this is quite easy. The change in y is just 0 to 0 0.0098, and the change in x is 0 to 270. Uh, this gives the answer here. And obviously, given our units of the y and the x, then our rate of reaction is moles per decimeter cube per second. So now we've worked out the initial rate of reaction. So the next bit is working out the rate constant. And so we need to turn our attention to the information given up in the question here. So bromine reacts with this methanoic acid. We know that bromine is the reactant of question that we've been monitoring by continuous monitoring methods at every interval. We also know that large excess of methanoic acid was used. So basically that 
ensures that it is zero order with respect to the methanoic acid. So our rate equation is not going to involve any methanoic acid in. And so it will look like so. So before we can do one of the two methods that we can approach this, we could rearrange it to get K now that we've been given a value for rate. But we're going to need to know to what order the bromine is to. Now, having looked at this graph, this concentration time graph, the curve suggests it's either first or second order. And at A level, we can work out if it's first order by seeing if it's got a constant half-life. So starting at the concentration 0 0.010, half of this is 0 0.005. And we're going to read off the time it takes in order for that to half. And we can see that that's between these two values, the, the start value in here. That's about 190 seconds. And we're going to half this 0 0.005 once again. So that's 0 0.0025. And we read off this graph once again. And here we've got roughly 210. And so these are fairly consistent half-lives, given uh, how difficult it would be to read off this, this graph. The mark scheme gives a plus or minus 20 second uh, leeway. So, but we can say that we've basically got a constant half-life, um, and the average of obviously these two together is 200 seconds. So we can clearly see that if we've got a constant half-life, that means we have the reactant A being first order. And so we could just rearrange the rate equation using the rate we've worked out up here, the bromine concentration, which was 0 0.010 to begin with, and rearrange that. Or we could use the fact that because we've got a first order reactant, that we use rate constant K is LUN2 over half-life of 200 seconds. If we put that into the calculator, then we get the rate constant as 0 0.0347. And the units of this, because of the y, is s minus 1. And shown in standard form, we've got it as this here. So that's six marks altogether through taking this approach through using a concentration time graph. So I want you to basically pause the video now and see if you can sketch the three different shapes of graphs that we'd expect for concentration time graphs for a zero order, first order and second order graph. Okay, now if your zero order as a reactant started here and went down as a direct line, first mark for you. A first order curve would look like this, and a second order curve would be slightly steeper and look like this. Now, one thing we noted is that between a first and second order graph, it's quite difficult to make that distinction based on just looking at the graph alone. We then did explore the idea that first order graphs do have a constant half-life, and so you could measure this, and that would therefore allow you to work out that it's definitely first order. However, there is another alternative method that you can do to differentiate between a zero, a first, and a second order graph, which comes into play, especially comparing first and second order graphs. These are a different type of graph, and this time it's using the initial rates for different concentrations of the reactant that you're looking at. So here's an initial rates experiment, and this time what you're going to do is you're going to plot a rate concentration graph. So we're going to have rate on the y-axis and we're going to have concentration on the x-axis. And so the initial rate is going to come from some data where you've collected the initial rate and the concentration will be of just one of the reactants. So whichever reactant that we want to basically look at. So in this case it could be the HCl. And so you would plot this data, you get some points and it will give you the shape of a graph. 
Now, the graph shape that you get is dependent on the order of reaction with respect to that reactant. The first initial rate concentration graph that we're going to look at is this one where it's flatlined. This shows that with respect to that, the concentration of that reactant that you've been basically changing, it is zero order, the relationship to the initial rate. Because as we change the concentration of the reactant, there is no change in the rate. So, for example, here, I mean, just qualitatively, if we double the concentration to here, we would expect if there was some sort of relationship for the initial rate to also double or increase. But no change in concentration has no change in the initial rate. On the other hand here, you can see we've got a directly proportional change. So if we increase the concentration here to double the amount, then the rate here also doubles. And so this graph is the graph we'd expect for a first order with respect to the reactant. So you'd see a straight line through the origin, which is zero. And we know that the concentration is directly proportional to the rate. Now, at A level, if you were to get a curved initial rate concentration graph, then it's second order with respect to that reactant. And the reason it is curved is because the rate is proportional to the concentration squared. Now, we can double check this by plotting a initial rate concentration squared graph. And that would convert it into something that looks like the first order where it's directly proportional, but this time it's proportional to the square of the concentration. And so these shapes of graphs are what you are going to be expected to know for A-level chemistry. It's really important to understand that the y-axis and the x-axis are different. These are initial rate versus concentration graphs, and that they have different shapes to the concentration time graphs we saw at the beginning of this video. And just to do a side-by-side -side comparison, in blue, I'm just going to sketch in what those concentration time graphs look like for the zero order, first order, and second order scenarios. Finally, to do with rate concentration graphs, if you are given a first order rate concentration graph, so one that you can tell because it would have a directly proportional line that goes through the origin of zero, then working out the rate constant k is a matter of working out the gradient of this initial rate concentration graph. So you take any two points um, on the y-axis and read off um, where they bisect the x-axis to get your change in y over change in x. And then this change in y over change in x will be directly linked to the rate constant k. Now this only works for first order graphs of which, again, the shape of that will be this directly proportional line here. And obviously the units for k is always just whatever the time is to the minus 1. So in this case, the units would be s to the minus 1. So that concludes our lesson on orders of reaction from graphs. Here you can see we've had a look at all these different specification points. There's lots of them. And it's really important that you can do each of these different skill sets. If you've enjoyed this video, ensure that you like the video and ensure that you subscribe to the Dr. BT's Chemistry Essentials YouTube channel for more videos tackling key ideas in A-level chemistry.